Hello there, Jeremy from Rotronic. So today we're going to take a look at how we pull data out of RMS uh, in a machine-to-machine -machine kind of format. So uh, this would be allowing data within RMS to be pulled into third-party software systems or uh, even other pieces of hardware with uh, software on board. So there's two ways of achieving this. We've built into RMS um, an API function so that's an application interface that allows the data to be pulled out through that RESTful API which is a very standard format uh, it comes out in JSON format um, and, and you can use it that way or alternatively because RMS is fundamentally built around an SQL database all the data, all the configuration, all the settings are saved into a standard SQL database then you can access the data through a standard means into the SQL now that is only possible if you're using an on-premise installation because with the cloud we don't allow you access to the SQL data. But if you have on-premise or if you have an exclusive cloud then you can use that direct SQL access. So first of all I'm going to show you the API function. So this is standard uh, RESTful API as said so it uses a, a JSON um, as the uh, sort of format and very similar to other APIs that you might have used out there. Um, so what I'm going to do to demonstrate this is I've got a simple uh, local system here uh, running on a, a little mini mini server RMS hub here and I've got my local temperatures being logged and a rate of change uh, but what I'm going to do is use a little bit of free software called Postman uh, it's an API software and it allows me to send the various commands I need to simulate requests obviously if you were doing this properly then you would wrap this all up into some sort of software uh, C++ or Python or whatever it is you want to use um, to run these commands and send the data to wherever, wherever you want it to go um, so this is this with this function we can use the cloud because it, we are talking to the RMS software itself and requesting the data so just like I'm requesting the data here via the web page to see a graph um, the the API function is allowing that similar sort of request to go through so first of all we have to request an API token this is kind of a security key uh, that gives us access to the data and to do that we send a request here we have uh, a standard post request part of the RESTful API function um, and we have headers uh, various bits of information need to fill in there on the headers all in the manuals all in the online manuals and there is also a blog on this as well um, but the key thing is the body of the text so here we have our, our function we're sending and we are sending the information user ID 2 so what on earth is user ID 2 you may ask well if we go into RMS and go to the setup here then we go to users and every user has a uh, unique ID actually I disabled this user so, so enable that user um, so user ID 2 is my guest account so that's the account that I'm going to use in this case on the cloud the user number will be some four digit number because we've obviously well passed just one or two users even though they're separate accounts it's a sequential number anyway so you need your user ID you need your username and you need your password me. let's go back here so here we are so we've got user ID 2 uh, username is guest password let me in one two three and the request type is data history and we want the token to last for 30 days which is the maximum we can request uh, obviously you can request a new token all the time but uh, this will allow it to last for 30 days so we hit send and we get the same answer we have down here we get a, uh, an okay response from the system excuse me and we get this token this string of text here so that is my kind of password that allows me to use the API and I get access to the data that this user has access to so it does mean through this API function you can segregate access so if the guest user only has or this particular user only has access to certain parts of RMS then they can only request data from that part which is uh, quite important for a lot of our customers so now what do we do now we go to the uh, data history part so we've got a slightly different address we're going to here data history request and we are requesting the uh, measuring point ID that we want to know data from a date to a date how many readings to download and the order and the nice thing here is if you put a date really far in the future like I have here 2099 and you set descending then you will get the, uh, the latest results because obviously it descends from uh, 2099 back to now so we'll put my key in there 
Um, and just to say, what is ID 1? Where did I get that from? Well, if I go to measuring points again, the measuring point ID here uh, is a sequential number as well. So I've made uh, four measuring points. I've obviously deleted some, um, but I've got my my temperature here, my rate of change. I think I had a temperature and humidity logger at one point, which I've deleted. So uh, let's send that request. And I've asked for the single reading, and we get here uh, again an OK response. I get the ID that I've requested. I get the name, which is helpful. Uh, confirms it's the right one. The parameter being measured, and I get the information. So I get that on the 16th of April at 23 minutes past uh, one, which is where we are now. Uh, and it tells me that it's uh, UTC plus one as well, so it adapts the time for the uh, local RMS time. I get my value 22.55. Uh, this logger is logging every 10 seconds, so yeah, there we go, slight change. If I wanted to have uh, loads of readings, then obviously I just put in the count there, um, and that'll download the last hour of data there, the 10 minute log interval, so you can see all the readings there slowly creeping up uh, as the weather warms up. So that's it. So this is just using a test software to do this. It's very handy to prove the function works and to understand the uh, the structure of the response and so on. But obviously you could wrap this into uh, Python, as said, or, or whatever, JavaScript, C -sharp, please C Sharp, C++, whatever you want to use. Um, but it uh, allows easy access to the data. OK, so that's the API. So the second option then is direct access to the SQL. And ultimately, this is no different to any other uh, SQL database, so you could use any uh, standard SQL interface uh, to do that. But I will demonstrate this using Excel, uh, just as an example. So, most important here is to have access to the SQL, it has to be your RMS installation. We don't give you access to the SQL via the cloud. Uh, so, I do have a local installation, so I am going to go here uh, in my Excel, I'm in the Data tab, and I'm going to Get Data from Database SQL Server Database. I have enabled access uh, to my server for SQL uh, requests, um, which is pretty standard, uh, but you may have to do it if you have RMS and uh, the SQL on the same server, uh, as I do. So. Um, yeah, so here's my server name, RMS Hub, and my database name is RMS. Again, that is pretty standard, but you may change it. So that's what we're going to do to connect. Uh, and then I will need to enter my username and password, assuming, yeah, there we are. So I'm going to enter my... Now, very important to make a... You obviously have to have a user uh, to access the database, and strongly advise using a read-only user account. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't use a uh, read-write user account, but you risk then editing the data and doing some serious damage to RMS. In addition, if you're in any kind of compliance uh, or anywhere with a basic quality system, really, you shouldn't be editing that data. Uh, RMS will detect edits to the SQL as well directly, so it will raise up validation flags. So better to have a uh, read-only user created by your admin team uh, so you can not do any damage. Anyway, we are using the password. We're going to connect to the database direct, and away we go. This will be a little bit slow. Uh, right, it's telling me there's, there's not an encrypted connection. That's fine. I've not set up my SQL. Uh, for encryption, so happy with that, but you could easily do that. So Excel will chew that over, it will be a little bit slow uh, on my PC here, but we will get connected and we will see a list of all the tables any moment now. Here they come. So these are all the tables within the RMS database, and as I said, every piece of configuration within RMS is stored in the SQL. It means you can take that SQL uh, away from the software, pop it somewhere else, reinstall the software, and everything comes back to life as it was. So, what do we need? Well, uh, data record is the key. These are the tables with all the uh, measured values in. So here's the temperatures from my logger, the timestamp, the measuring point ID, and a sort of status flag there. So that's definitely one table I want to have access to. But I don't really necessarily know what measuring point ID 1 is, uh, especially if I have uh, tens or hundreds of measuring points. So let's grab the measuring points table, 
which has information about the measuring points. We saw that we had two measuring points, uh, and we can see the names here and uh, all the other bits of information about them. And potentially we want the device as well, so we might want to know about the device. So there's a device table here which lists all the devices. So there are the three tables I'm going to load. Uh, this will take a moment. And once we are loaded, then we can start to analyze the data and uh, it creates some relationships so it makes it a little bit easier to use. So I'm just chewing this over, it will get there. Uh, because I'm logging every 10 seconds on this logger, it is actually quite a hefty uh, amount of data in the uh, in the data record too. Uh, data record 3 is all the data from I believe a day uh, over a day old so it kind of it kind of shifts or it shifts it into a, a second table. Uh, right it's all loading it's getting the once this is loaded then what I need to do is create relationships to uh, tell Excel that this, these tables are linked uh, so that we can get instead of having measuring point ID 1, we get the measuring point name. There we go, okay, so uh, the data's all loading. So, oh no, it's still going, come on. All right, we're there, good. So uh, there are my uh, 367,000 rows, that's why it took a little while. So let's do the relationships here. So, um, is this, uh, yeah, okay, good. Let's usually get auto-detect there, but anyway. So we're gonna select here the data record two table, and we are going to link the measuring point ID to the measuring point table and we're going to link it to the ID of the measuring point. So that creates the first link, click OK on that and then we'll do a second one that links the uh, measuring point ID uh, device ID there, to uh, the device ID. There we go. So that creates the links I need. Um, you might be able to do auto detect normally you can, I don't know if it works. Right, then we've done our relationships, so that makes the data a bit more usable, and we are not going to do that. We are going to insert a pivot table. We all love a good pivot table. And what do we want to do? I'll just do a basic demo here. So we're going to want to put values down in the values tab. We are going to want to put timestamp in the rows tab. That will take a moment. There we go, so there's all our kind of raw data and a bit of a mess, but we can filter by device name, so that means I can select for different devices. Uh, da -da -da -da. And actually I don't really have very exciting data here, but I would put the name in the columns. So if we had temperature and humidity, we would have uh, the temperature and humidity values there. So let's see what that does for my pivot table. Uh, there we are. So, okay, so I can filter here for instead of all devices, I'll just select my PT100 logger. Don't need the grand total tab, but uh, we'll leave it for now. And obviously, I can sort my time by newest to oldest. This will take Excel a moment lowly computer struggling, uh, thinking about it, there we go, okay, so 12.29, uh, so we can see here it's 13.31, so this is coming raw from the SQL and all the SQL data is stored in UTC time, so uh, coordinated time, very standard for uh, software, so you would need to adapt this to your local time. We saw in the uh, API that the, uh, the data is adapted for local time. So here we are though, uh, I have my data, Ooh, crikey. Um, and I can now go and do whatever I want to do with it, uh, and I could have access to all the other devices if I had any. Uh, we can, the only one I can choose is something with no device, hello, and uh, that would be my rate of change. Take a moment to load. So there we are. You could use Access. You could use any other piece of software to obviously do this. Uh, you just need that user account and you need that access to the SQL itself. Uh, there's my rate of change. We can see so slightly warming up here slowly. There we go. So hopefully that's useful. That's two examples of how you can access data within RMS. Uh, in a machine-to-machine -machine way. I've, I've obviously done this all manually, but you could write everything I've done into uh, software, and it might allow you to uh, 
pull a temperature value out onto a label printer as you print your packaging labels it might allow you to integrate data into uh, more advanced kind of uh, BMS type systems um, or particular reporting uh, platforms that you have whatever you need so RMS acts as the central store it acts as the, uh, the main device management it gathers all the data it's secure um, and it's compliant to uh, the pharmaceutical standards but we know that people want to be able to take uh, data further and do more with it, so that's how uh, that's why we allow these two approaches. The API also allows data to flow in, but we'll do that uh, another time. So please comment, uh, any questions, reach out to us, and yeah, we will see you next time. Thank you.